Hello, everybody, and welcome to the AfriCam show. Always live and always wild. It's me, Trishala, by the way, and we're starting off here at Aldonio with a beautiful bunch of giraffes. I'm always impressed by the giraffes at Aldonio. Now, if you hear the gentle pitter patter, maybe it's not so gentle. It's raining, and I'm out in the bush, which means that I'm living the bush life, and I have a tin roof. So it's, it may be a little bit noisy, but I'm hoping that with this mic of mine, it won't pick up too much. Uh, but hello, everyone, and welcome. Like I said, in the bush, and it only makes me happier to be able to spend time with all of you and be in the bush because it's like I'm already in gear, you know, when I'm at home and I'm doing the AfriCam show for all of you and with all of you, rather. Um, I'm... It really makes me miss being out in the bush, but now I am out in the bush and it just feels like everything is right with the world. Now, if this is the first time that you're joining us for the AfriCamp show, welcome. We are so, so happy to have you on board and part of our AfriCamp community. It is a live and interactive show, which means that you can send through questions and comments. We can have nice discussions about animal behavior because our cams are running. 24 hours a day throughout the year. So maybe you have burning questions. Maybe you've seen something on the cameras. Maybe you've seen something giraffes have been doing on the cameras, but you haven't had the opportunity to ask a guide. Uh, and that's where I come in. Now's your time. The next 45 minutes or so is your time to ask any questions that you may have. But to start us off, we have a whole lot of hellos, which I love to listen to. April Owls, the first in. April Owls says, good morning from sunny Connecticut. This week you were watching the baby elephants slip and slide their way up the muddy banks to get out of the water. <laughs> yes, that is how it's going at this time of the year, and we'll get into that as well. You say it's very enjoyable and you can't wait for today's show. Oh, that makes me happy. You're always such in such good spirits, April Owl. But you, what you're talking about, you know, the slipping and sliding of animals around the water holes at the moment, it is very entertaining, but I can imagine that it's probably a little nerve-wracking for the animals, particularly the small ones, and also the tall ones, like these giraffe, falling on your behind, or in the case of the giraffe on their side, is really not ideal. In fact, that's one of the ways that lions tend to hunt giraffe. They try to chase them to the point where maybe they trip over um, a tiny little drainage line, you know, like a tributary coming off the main drainage. Uh, so they can be quite vulnerable to falling over. And the reason it is this way at this time of the year is because water holes are starting to dry up. I mean, some of the pans I've seen in the last week are already completely dry, but those are the ephemeral pans or the, the seasonal pans, so they're not permanent water sources. And with drying up water comes a whole lot of mud, and that mud can cause animals to slip and slide all over the place. But here at Aldonio, it seems that things are still nice and verdant, nice and green. And the giraffes are enjoying some shade and a little bit of a play. I can see some gentle necking. I mean, I wouldn't even call that sparring. I'd just call that maybe touching, <laughs> bonding perhaps. So in m lots of places across Af Africa. So Aldonio is in East Africa. Uh, and I'm speaking from a Southern African perspective, but a lot of places in Africa have a similar, um, a similar kind of seasonal pattern. That being that there isn't really a distinct autumn or spring, so we're better off because our, our average temperatures, you know, it doesn't really fluctuate too much, it doesn't get extremely cold, um, and it doesn't get extremely, extremely hot, you know, like in the 50 degrees Celsius range in places where there are an abundance of animals. You know, if we're talking about desert, then those are extremities that, or, or extreme places that I'm not talking about, I'm talking about in general. So because of that, we don't really experience a 
you know, a gradual move into spring or a gradual move into winter. So that's why we, d we kind of section out the year as a wet season and a dry season because, because the temperatures, you know, are so average and there's not a huge jump in the temperatures. What is more important is the avail availability of water. So now we are moving into the dry season but temperatures are still quite high. And that's why these giraffe are making sure that they're in a nice bit of shade here. Because while it's around, you might as well be making the most of it. That goes for shade and that goes for water too. Africa rocks, you say good morning from Michigan, everyone. You're excited and sipping your yummy chocolate and berry protein smoothie. My goodness, that sounds delightful, Africa rocks. I couldn't imagine something better than having a tasty smoothie and the African bush. Now you have me thinking about perhaps I should have prepared myself a smoothie for the show, but then I wouldn't be able to talk, would I? McCuff, you say good morning from San Diego. Good morning, McCuff. It's nice to hear from someone in San Diego. I have family that live in San Diego and I, I really like San Diego a lot. Amber Co, you say, happy Tuesday all, with thanks to all that bring us these shows. Thanks, Trish, for being our guide. You've got coffee and muffin, and you are ready. I'm so glad to hear it. And I'm so glad that we have these beautiful giraffe to start off with. There might have been, I think there's about 10, or at least when we first got here, there were about 10. Perhaps they've already had a drink. Perhaps they're not that thirsty or they'll come to to the actual water hole a little later but for now it looks like it's just about socializing bonding getting a bit of a snack all very important things now giraffes have an, a oh, I suppose it, uh, it is interesting I was going to say it, they have a very interesting social structure but maybe unusual is a better word in that they they can be found completely alone, that goes for females, that goes for males, or they can fi be found in groups like this. And those groups can be mixed, those groups can be bachelor herds, um, obviously we'll see females and calves together until they reach maturity, but it's, it's what's called a fission-fusion society, so they come together sometimes and they move away sometimes, but they're still some level of a dominance hierarchy in the area and when we have gatherings like this now I can't see their ossicones very clearly and I can't see their undercarriages too clearly to see if they have a penis sheath but based on their behavior there's a lot of necking going on I'd say this is, this is pretty much a bachelor group although the one on the extreme right there hasn't been engaging in any necking so maybe she's a female but these gentle necking sessions, yes it does build bonds, it lets everyone know what's going on with the giraffes around in the area. They're all aware of each other and the only time they're really competing is for females in estrus. But right now, even though it's gentle, even though it's playful, they're still using this opportunity to figure out the dominance hierarchy. There will be a dominant bull in the area and he's usually quite dark and very large. But what about everyone else? They also need to f figure out where they fit in the hierarchy. All right, so the one on the right has started to also engage in a little bit of necking, so I would say that this is a bachelor group. Zygote, you say namaste to Shala, namaste to you too, Zygote. Thank you for jumping on board. Diana, you say good morning from Seattle. Daylight savings just started here, so it happens at a time when I can join. Yay! And you're ready with your coffee. Of course you are. I love it when people get excited about changes in daylight savings and that allows them to you know, catch the beginning of a live show or finally be able to watch the last bit of the live show. I think it's so exciting. Jan Powers, you say hi everyone. Hope one and all are having a wonderful day. Thank you, I am having a wonderful day. I hope that all of you are too. Jean Gale, you say good morning from, uh, from rainy Seattle. Well, yeah, in the low felt of South Africa and the bush, it's also rainy. Bird Book, you say hello, 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 Bird Book. Andy, you say good afternoon, all. 
<laughs> you say, am I jealous that Taylor didn't take me with her? Uh, I would be. I would be, Andy. Uh, Taylor's been doing a whole lot. I think she was in Botswana, a little bit in Zambia. Uh, so she's been moving and shaking all over the place. But, Andy, I'm in the bush now, so that's what counts, and I'm very happy. Virginia Paul, you say, Trishala, I love to hear your voice. Yes, Virginia, it's me. <laughs> Kauru, you say, hi, Trishala. Hi, Kauru. Jan Powers, you say, you're so grateful that I'm enjoying the bush and grateful for the much-needed rain. Yes, indeed. Anyway, we've moved back down to South Africa now, and we are in Tau. And we can see a lot of kudu. These kudu are looking extra smooth today. It's interesting that you can see the exact same species of animal across different parts of southern Africa. I'm speaking for southern Africa because that's where I've traveled the most in terms of observing wildlife. And you can see the same bird, the same species of bird, the same species of antelope, but there can be subtle differences. And I love observing those. Like here in, in the low felt where I am now, the bush is very dense in many areas. There are open areas, but the bush is very dense in many areas. And I find that the kudu here tend to be a, a little bit more stripy than what we're observing here and what I've observed in Madikwe previously. So Tao Lodge is in a game reserve called Madikwe Game Reserve. And the vegetation is different in, at Madikwe. There's, um, there are thickets and uh, those dense thickets are made up of a, a bush called sickle bush. But other than that, it's pretty open. When we think about the stripes or perhaps any pattern on, a, on an animal's coat, really, those are meant to help camouflage an animal, whether it's like, you know, an obvious camouflage, like with a, um, with a leopard, for instance, because it has a dappled effect of the dark and the light, or it's a more subtle thing like a disruptive coloration. Whatever it is, these stripes tend to break up the outline of an animal. Same goes for a leopard, same goes for a kudu. So imagine you're in a dense bush like I am here in the low felt. You're in the dense bush, but there's little slivers of light coming through. Those little slivers might resemble those stripes, but perhaps you're in a more foresty area or an area with large trees. Um, for example, you know, you spend a lot of time hanging around in a marula tree like a leopard does, then the dappled light that comes in tends to be more round. So the circumstances in terms of habitat, where the animal lives, whether it prefers a thicket, whether it prefers hanging out in trees, whether it prefers to be out in the open, like uh, impalas, can also determine their coat pattern uh, over evolutionary time. Or we have a big ellie bull coming through, now, for an elephant bull, or any elephant really, the need to camouflage, uh, or I should say the selective pressure in evolutionary terms to blend in better, is not there. Because it's the biggest land mammal on the planet. Nobody's going to be messing with that guy, except an equally matched elephant bull, perhaps. Bob from Kalamazoo is here. You say, happy Tuesday to Shala. Thank you, Bob. Happy Tuesday to you, too. Now, after I gave you this whole spiel about um, the stripes and these kudu feeling less like the stripes I see here, as they move closer to the cam, I see they pretty much look the same. But it is an interesting discussion when you think about the way that different coat patterns actually arise. So I spoke a little bit about how the same species across different areas, different um, more large-scale habitats can be different. I mean, it's the same if you look at a bird call or you listen to a bird call. Birds can have accents. So the exact same bird call I'd hear here in the low felt can sound just a little bit different to that exact bird's call, or exact species call, in, say, the Eastern Cape of South Africa. 
in the Albany Thicket region. And so can the way animals look just a little bit. I find that very, very interesting. But it makes sense if you think of it. And it kind of makes me feel a little bit like I've got uh, an insight into evolution at that time. Oh, we have people walking past. I hope you didn't hear them. <laughs> it's tough finding a quiet place in the bush, especially when it's raining. Rolling trouble, you say, woohoo, finally made it. I'm so glad that you could come on board and join us. We were watching some giraffes up at Aldonio, and now we're down at Tal, watching some kudu. Yeah, it looks like we have some Egyptian geese with a very successful group of goslings there. I've seen a few goslings uh, over the last while. I feel I always feel a little bit weird calling them goslings. I almost want to call them Egyptian geeselings because Egyptian geese are not actually technically geese. They're more closely related to shell ducks than they are to geese. So it makes me want to say Egyptian geeselings because I can't don't really want to say ducklings either. But I've been seeing quite a few uh, of them around and you know when it starts off, they may have as many as seven or eight little chicks following them around. And then as we go through and they start to get larger and grow up, you know, they drop off. And the most recent pair I saw last time, I saw them but not in person. There were about six or seven of them, and now there's only one. But these two, they seem to be quite successful. I think there's about four or five of their chicks that have survived. Oh, the rain is starting to come down a little harder. Now, um, it was Jan, yes, Jan Powers, you were saying the much needed yeah. rain and that you're, you're grateful for it, absolutely. You know, when I was moving around the bush at this and this really good goes for across the board at the moment in southern Africa we're over at Oliphant's River now having a look at a hippo now, thankfully Oliphant's River doesn't totally fall into the category of the story I'm telling you now well not really a story but what I'm about to share with you because Oliphant's River is a pretty pretty strong river and I don't think I've ever seen it uh, dried up, ever. And it's quite a long river as well. But driving around uh, the bush at the moment, you can see that things are dry. Things are very dry. Grasses are already starting to yellow. I mean, it's completely natural. I think that noticing the grasses is probably my my first thing that I notice when when I think ah dry season starting to set in oh no Oliphant's River there we go back at Tau oh and here comes another Ellie ball unless the other one thought that it needed to cut scene and reset and come back from the same side <laughs> so grasses have shallow roots and grasses part of their life cycle is uh, to die off well, at least not the roots, but for their leaves and inflorescences to dry off during the dry season and for them to be eaten because grasses grow like your, um, like your hair does. So, you know, your hair grows from the root, not from the tip. And plants, they grow, or rather I shouldn't say plants because grasses are still plants, trees and shrubs, they grow from the tip, from the apex outward not from the bottom down. So grasses, they need to be eaten to grow successfully, otherwise they'll just fall over each other. And they have to be seasonal as well. And that's all part of their life cycle. But because they have shallow roots, well, I suppose it's all part of it, 
They have shallow roots and that means they can't really access water in the same way as larger plants can. So they tend to be the ones that yellow first. But those seasonal plants I was telling you about, they're all dry, dry, dry. Even the leaves and trees are starting to get dry and then it really feels like this dry season is going to be a proper dry season. You might see that quite a few of the water holes where we have cams are going to dry up significantly. But many of the water holes that we watch tend to be pumped and that allows for a little more, um, a little more relief, I suppose. But jam powers, I am thankful for this rain because maybe some of those seasonal pans or ephemeral pa pans will start to fill up a little bit, but it's not going to last very long. It'll be fun for a bit, though. Sanjeev Roy, you say, what a confident Illy bull walking across. He is very confident, isn't he? And as he was walking across as well, oh, we've moved away from him. Maybe he's moving into the bush or maybe he'll walk through again. Uh, as he was going, he was tossing sand onto himself as well, using every trick in the book to keep cool. Ah, I see some even elephants in the distance there. What do we have here? Some wildebeest in front of us as well. So remember, we were talking about slipping and sliding. Little elephant bulls, I think April Owl was saying. <laughs> Sorry, little elephant bulls. Little elephant calves. Now this here at Tau, this waterhole, is a major culprit. As you can see, those edges are nice and rounded and muddy. Perfect. Perfect for slipping and sliding. And unfortunately, those little calves... You know, their trunks are not as long as everybody else's just yet. And they've got to stretch their way in. And before you know it, they're, you know, their toes are right at the edge. And they can slip in. But there's always a family member around to help them out. Rolling trouble, you say. It's raining here in Western Australia, too raining all around. It's raining in Seattle. It's raining here. It's raining in Western Australia. I, although I must say, hearing that it's raining in Seattle wasn't a massive surprise. <laughs> but we are very thankful for the rains. Mr. H UAE 87, you say that yesterday was the starting of Ramadan in your country. Well, all the best for your fast, Mr. H UAE. If you are participating, all the best. And then once you're back um, and have had a successful fast, I'm sure we'll hear all about the wonderful goodies you usually have. Oh, there we go. Elephants back, moving through. I must say the vegetation is still looking pretty good at Madikwe. Um, but you know, the rains came late at Madikwe too. When everyone or everywhere else was having a good amount of rain and things were starting to get green and perk up, Madik was still looking pretty grey and drab. So the rain started late. Maybe that'll mean that things will stay greener for a little bit longer. Hey, Prairie Dog, welcome. You say you're really enjoying the Africam show. Well, we are very glad that you are enjoying the Africam show. We must admit. Oh, look at this kudu on the left. Look at the way her ears have perked up. And they moved very intentionally in a single direction. And she was zoning in on something. And those really big ears make a lot of sense because you know, coming back to what we were talking about before, we were talking about the coat patterns and how different habitat affect how those coat patterns develop. You know, if they're in a more dense, bushy habitat, maybe light comes through in a different way um, than if you hang out in a tree, it can be more dappled effect. So, an animal's, or I should say in the most basic way, 
uh, natural selection works, or not natural selection, but evolution works in a way where environmental changes drive the natural selection. So changes in the environment, like maybe you're suddenly, so, I don't know, there's a, there's a flood plain, like this plain just floods and it becomes a river. So those types of effects are what drive natural selection, drive change in animals. And so their preferred habitat drives a lot and lot, a lot of changes, drives the, the, the entire being. What we see today is a result of that animal's preferred habitat. We're back up here at Old Donyo now, watching the giraffe. See, they've come away from their shady spot. Come to have a little bit of a drink. They are lovely. I'm just going to finish up that thought very quickly. But those kudu's ears, we are looking at her ears. In fact, if you look at the giraffe's ears, they're small compared to a kudu's ears, right? Those kudu's ears were big, like satellite dishes moving independently. Now, a giraffe, the majority of the time, it's, you know, it's a tall animal, <laughs> five meters tall. So they don't need a whole lot of equipment auditory equipment to pick up sound because sound waves are not being disrupted by the bushiness. So if there was dent if they were shorter, they'd probably have larger ears because dense bush means that sound waves are constantly being distorted, blocked, deflected, all those kinds of things. Now for a kudu, kudus thrive in a dense habitat. They like to be where they have enough cover. But that also means they're not going to hear very well because the sound waves are constantly being um, muted in a way by all the vegetation around it. So they have great big ears to make sure that they don't miss out on potential threats, the sounds of potential threats. Bird book, you say this is so fun to watch. It is fun to watch. You know, one of the things that I love about this show is that, you know, just to remind yourself that this is happening right now. This is live. So right now, in East Africa, at Old Donyo, there's these four giraffes that are chilling at this waterhole and urinating at the waterhole. Yeah, uh, giraffes are not one of those animals that I associate with uh, any kind of fussiness <laughs> in terms of their water quality, unlike elephants. Oh man, all of you that have been watching the show for a while with me, maybe you know why I'm disappointed. I should have been counting how many seconds this took that giraffe. Yes. Fluid dynamics, bladder volume, 21 seconds. It should be 21 seconds. I don't know who was counting, but I wasn't. And I must say that this looks like it's going on for longer. <laughs> yes, we saw you. Yes, we did. Luckily, uh, I think that the back half of its body was outside of the water, so at least it's not at least it's not urinating in the water. We can always be thankful for that. <laughs> Prairie dogs, you say, giraffes drinking is so much fun to watch. It is, it is really fun to watch, um, and when you think about all the physiological hurdles they've had to overcome to get to to just drink. Imagine lowering your head five meters to touch the ground, to touch the water. I mean that's quite a feat. Now, apart from that there's blood pressure to think about
there's the position of your of your limbs because they're so long. Where do you bend? How do you bend? And of course, there's different styles because how you bend doesn't really affect your survival. As long as you can get up quick enough, if there is a potential threat around, so that means that we get a few styles. You get the the ones that splayed their legs, you know, straight out in the diagonal, so they look like they're making a little tent. You get the ones that bend. I find the ones that bend uh, um, more conservative, a little bit more reserved. The ones that spread their legs and they splay it, they feel like, you know, they, they want to take up space. But what I also enjoy Prairie Dog is watching the moments before they drink because they can be so nervous around a water hole and the time just before when they're just kind of looking around dipping their head a little bit then picking it up again and then dipping again and then picking it up again and it takes them such a such a long time to just kind of like actually go for it but very very fun to watch My goodness, I didn't, <laughs> didn't even see the giraffe in the back there. But now we are down at Naledi in Baluli, which is not too far from where I am now. Um, near, I don't know, about a five, six hour drive. But our elephant bull seems to be a little stuck. Well, the bull's not stuck. Ah, there we go. Now we can see... Now oh, we can see it having a good old drink. Oh, I love to see elephants drinking. I saw so many elephants today. They make me so happy watching elephants. Oh, we've got a little splash as well. Now this looks like a... Oh, and a vehicle going by. Hello, vehicle. Well, that explains the splash probably got a little spooked by the vehicle <laughs> and we're back over at tower we've got a beautiful line of wildebeest coming through I love when they walk like this they just um, they're prime for an epic movie scene when they walk like this in a straight line you know how I love the symmetry <laughs> HH you say hello Trishala nice to hear your voice nice to hear from you HH Thank you for joining us for the Afrocam show. Now, wildebeest are not as heavy, heavily water reliant as, say, buffalo or elephants, but nonetheless, they are going to follow the water and follow the rains. In fact, that's why during the Great Mi Migration in East Africa. The whole reason that the wildebeest migrate is because they're following the rains. But they're not necessarily following water for the purpose of drinking and cooling down like many large herbivores do, like elephants and buffalo to an extent, but I'll get into that because buffalo are not really drinking a whole lot of water because they're always uh, needing to cool down because of their diet they eat a lot of well they're bulk grazers so they're eating a lot of grass um, but also they're not just eating fresh grass they're eating dry grass and they're eating it in bulk so that means that they're going to need a lot of water to process all of that vegetation but wildebeest wildebeest want the good stuff they want the nice grass and that means that they've got to be able to follow the rains for the purpose of getting the nice fresh juicy grass. Now here in southern Africa once upon a time there used to be a migration definitely not to the size of the great migration in East Africa but there used to be a wildebeest migration because wildebeest want to follow the rain and they want to follow the availability of their favorite resource which is good juicy grass. Uh, with the creation of dams and pans that are pumped It means that they can still have the availability of the things they need and not really have to migrate. 
but honestly the the reason that migration stopped in southern africa was because of fences and and migration patterns being disrupted by physical obstacles i see the elliot at the top there as well hello elie i do love them and a little zb as well there's been such a wonderful variety of you know there always is a wonderful variety of of um animals here at tal from the birds to the reptiles to the mammals that frequent this water hole you know you could sit here for hours see different things coming through Everyone's just heading in for that sweet water, although I can't imagine it's that sweet in that particular area because uh, it looks very muddy. But like I said, not everybody has the fussy preferences of elephants when it comes to water. I mean, even as they're walking in this area, you can see that they're, as they put their hooves down, it's kind of sinking into the ground. It's telling you how muddy it is. Now there are a few young calves. There's one come bounding through there from the left. Another one following. If you're looking to have a laugh while watching natural history stuff, you know, watching wildlife in general, watch youngsters. Watch calves, watch babies, because they are hilarious, particularly the mammal ones, because they, are, they tend to want to kind of follow what adults are doing. They have to move along with their herd or their family group. But the imitation of what adults do is just hilarious. Uh, because they, they, you know, like watching elephants or watching these little wildebeest trying to step through the mud just like the adults do, but they don't quite have the coordination or the skill just yet. So they, they can be very amusing. At the same time, if they didn't have a go and try to, uh, to act out whatever the adults around them are doing, then they wouldn't learn and they wouldn't build up that coordination as well as the, the strength necessary to become a fully fledged wildebeest or any other animal from that. Ingrid Vessels, you say hello from Cape Town. Trishala, it's nice to hear your voice again. Thank you so much. I feel like, do we have a lot of people that haven't heard my voice in a while? You all should jump on board a little bit more. It's nice to hear and see familiar names. I definitely love to spend this time with all of you and spend the time with, with the wildlife. I, I love speaking about wildlife, um, but not just wildlife. It's almost just life. Because we tend to think of wildlife as, um, as things that have these crazy adaptations and look at the way this is happening, look at the ways that that is happening. And it's so true, but all life is like that. The plants in your garden have similar adaptations to those out here. The um, you know, urban wildlife that you may see, your own you know, domestic cats, they are so, so similar to the animals out here too. So really, I enjoy talking to you all about life, not just wildlife. Ooh, the rain's starting to... Ah, you know, it ebbs and flows. It comes hard and then goes away. But I think we can ex expect this to last another day, I think which again would be fantastic for the bush. I've already seen some of the, the water holes dry up in person and I'm sure you've seen across the cams that the water holes have started to dry up as well. Um, and, and what that means is that the concentration of sediments, of algae, 
all those maybe not so nice things, bacteria, as volume decreases, the concentration of those things that were in that volume increases. So the water quality, quality tends to drop. Rolling trouble, you say muddy for sure. Absolutely. And this, this type of soil, you can see it's very fine clay soil um, and very dark. When we see this type of soil, this black cotton soil-ish soil, it's a no-no to drive on. For one, it's very difficult for that to recover because it's so fine-grained and like clay, it can almost like keep that shape of, say, a tire spinning or whatever. It can keep that shape for years. Um, but on top of that, it is so, so, so risky. I cannot explain. You, uh, the control you have over the vehicle reduces significantly. Now you might be thinking about the dry season and well, if everything dries up and plants dry up and grasses die as part of their life cycle, how do the animals manage to survive? Animals in the wild, they're, they're not used to consistency in the way that we are. We think, you know, you eat every day, the day you don't eat is you know, maybe like Mr. HUAE 87, you're fasting, which makes sense because you're choosing to be that way. But normally we, or maybe you miss a day of eating, you know, but it's something that you think about because you're so used to consistency of eating. But in the wild and as it would have been hundreds and thousands of years ago as well for hominids or, uh, or even direct homo sapien ancestors, Things would have also been just like in the bush, feast and famine. And now we have a lovely squirrel. Are you a ground squirrel? We can't see you very clearly. It's all, it's, it's all about getting as much as you can when you can, because you don't know when your next meal is going to come around. Oh, hello. When this, uh, this ground squirrel, yep, it's a ground squirrel, when it, Woke up like that, it reminded me of you, Prairie Dog, just because of your name. <laughs> oh my goodness, you are too cute. I find that small mammals, I don't know if it's just me, but I find them so charismatic so full of character, they're just so entertaining. And the thing is that if you're here in person, to get this kind of sighting and you're just watching an unstriped ground squirrel doing its thing, it's, it's never going to happen. Unless you're sitting there quietly for some time and then the squirrel happened to not notice you. But it's such a rare thing. And that is the beauty of these cams. These animals can behave as if no one's looking, except there's all of us looking. <laughs> I love how it ducks down and then picks up and then ducks down. So another way to deal with the dry season, because animals still got to eat, um, it just can't feast like it would during the wet season. But uh, a great life strategy to overcome the changes in the seasons and perhaps drought and flood, you know, the extreme versions of the, of the seasonal circumstance, a great way to deal with that is to be omnivorous. And the majority of, of squirrels actually are omnivorous, including the ground squirrel. So it'll be going, going after bits of vegetation, fruits and seeds and nuts and things like that, of course, the usual things we associate with squirrels, but also insects. 
maybe even other small animals, maybe like, you know, little lizards and things like that. I will tell you that uh, recently, recently I dissected uh, a slender mongoose. Of course, different to a squirrel. A squirrel, a squirrel is a rodent. A mongoose is, um, is a carnivore in the order Carnivora. Not rodentia, like a rodent. So ominous giraffe shadow coming our way. <laughs> so it is different, but I was just I'm just talking about small animals. Um, and I did check out its stomach contents in the in the slender mongoose, and it was full of geckos. Would you believe it? Anyway, on that note, our 45 minutes together has come to an end. I hope that you will continue to watch the cameras, see the way the changes or the season changes, the landscape and all of that. And I hope that you have a fantastic time wherever you are out in the world. And all the best. See you next time and goodbye for now. Uh, uh, uh.